All right. Hello and welcome to another episode of Around the Horns, the show where we are talking about everything involving the University of Texas baseball program. I am your host, Aaron. I am here with my co-host, Zach. Zach, we just watched Texas attempt the sport of baseball this weekend against the Baylor Bears, who were attempting it even less than the University of Texas, as Texas won two out of three in Waco, which is always a good thing. We are, of course, going to talk about that Baylor series. We've got a lot to talk about there. I feel like we are probably going to be talking a little more pitching than usual in this episode. We will, of course, check in on the rest of the Big 12, hit on some around the country stuff, and then just get into some conversations about what we would do with uh, with this team and just some hypothetical back and forth. But before we get to all of that, Zach, please let the people know how you are doing as we record this on Tuesday afternoon. Yeah, you know, doing well. Um, I don't think I ever have to worry about Texas going to Baylor for a game of baseball again. I could be wrong on that, but I think do they have t- well, two seasons or one season left. If it's only one season, we're done. Um, but yeah, just, I'm, you know, a series win. I don't know if it was the fumes off the Brazos, but like everything has felt a little hazy the last two days. Just, yeah, let's get the heck out of there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was the first note I put down. And it was just like Waco, Texas, just never again. I can't do it after the, I didn't even go. I was just sitting here on my couch, but I just like, I don't know what happened to the pitching staff. If just they had a, a bad experience at the hotel, if if their pillows were not soft enough in the, in the Waco hotels, if, like you talked about some fumes coming off the river. Maybe the mound was all jacked up. There were like worms coming out. I I do not know what happened. Um, it was not the Texas pitching staff that we had become accustomed to seeing um, up to this point in the season. But nevertheless, we are going to talk about it. Um, you know, a road series win in conference is always a good thing, you would think, in the Big 12. This, this should have been a sweep, but I don't know. I like this, this question kind of goes to show how spoiled you know, we could be as, as Texas fans or, you know, just in general, how, how nice some big blue blood programs have it sometimes. But was this was this a worse road series conference win that you, you can remember? You've been you've been following the team for a long time. <laughs> yeah, um, I struggled to find one that was worse. Maybe when Baylor walked it off to sweep Texas and Drew Stubb, like didn't even throw home, like he picked up the ball from center field and threw it into the Brazos. Um, yeah, I mean, this, this is legitimately one of the worst conference road wins that I've seen. Like when people talk about college baseball and they say, well, college baseball plays at a really high level. You see guys like Zach Neto walking from a Campbell or a yeah, Campbell program straight into the bigs at 220 days later. This was the epitome of what college baseball truly is. Everything's fair game. Everyone plays like shit at some point. It's going to be just a, a knuckle brawl just you never know what you're gonna get some guys could be really really good and then you could literally set historic bad levels um so yeah it was it was college baseball we we saw it we lived through it um yeah we got a series w that's that's about all you can say <laughs> yeah i mean that's uh, that's exactly the point I, w- I was thinking about that too it's like man you're talking about you know division one college baseball players playing in the big 12 i mean these are the top you know, one, two percent in the entire world of playing the sport of baseball. Like these guys are just incredible. And then you just you watch a weekend like this and it's just a reminder like, oh, man, this is this is just not Major League Baseball. You know, sometimes a lot of these guys just got a long way to go. But, um, you know, all these guys are extremely talented and that, that shows at times. Um, I think that is a good segue to the Friday night game and talking about Lucas Gordon. Um, Zach, one pitcher that um, we do not we should not be concerned about at this moment in time is Lucas Gordon, man. He uh, continues to absolutely kill it. He went six innings through 102 pitches. Nice little range there. Not too many pitches gave him a nice solid six Um, exited the game with the big lead. We'll get to the rest of the game a little bit later, but I mean, the thing that stands out right now with me, you know, about Lucas Gordon is he he just kind of has it all going right now. He's, he's got the fastball command. Most games, the changeup has come back in a really nice way. The slider has continued to get better as the season has gone on. Like we thought that it might, um, he just looks like a guy that is comfortable out there in a Friday night role. He knows, he knows he's the guy, he knows what the team needs from him and he just continues to deliver, you know, pretty much game in and game out at this point. It's been, it's been pretty fun to watch. Yeah. I'd say, you know, the, the announcers kind of picked on this as well, but 
it doesn't matter if the bases are loaded, if there's no men on base, it, you know, it's storming weather. The only game that I've seen Lucas really be out of his element, I don't know if he was just in a bad headspace or what it was, but that was that uh, Cal State Fullerton game out, you know, in Cali. Other than that, it doesn't, nothing seems to affect him. He is, he's the epitome of Cali cool. And, you know, he's there for it. He's there to have fun. I feel like when he gets in danger, he has more fun than when he's just like pitching ahead and kind of cruising. He doesn't have the same emotions. You look at him, you're like, is he bored out there? Like what, you know, I feel like he's the out kid in right field, like picking grass. <laughs> he gets a couple of guys on with no outs and you see him come alive. You're like, oh, there's the competitor. There's the guy that's just, you know, running roughshod over teams right now. So yeah, it, he's, he's definitely not a guy that you worry about going in week in, week out. Yeah, I mean, I think he he stranded three different leadoff doubles in that game. He was maybe he was just doing that because he was bored. He's like, you know what? I'm just gonna spot these guys two bases and uh, we'll see maybe if I can get out of this one yet again. And he kept doing it. He just kept getting yeah. out of it over and over again. Um, really impressive stuff. Of course, also on Friday night, um, a bit of a scare there at the end. Baylor scored a boatload of runs in the eighth and ninth inning as Texas um tried to save some of their higher leverage arms and they threw some guys out there that um haven't had as many innings this year and just don't have that much experience and that much success, um, you know, in, in big 12 weekend series. And it just backfired. They, they had some problems throwing strikes. Baylor started to hit some home runs there. Um, were you ever concerned like, Oh man, this, we might have, like Texas might actually lose this game or was it just, why am I still having to <laughs> watch this game right now? It should be over 20 minutes ago. What were your kind of emotions there late in the game on Friday? Yeah, you know, I actually agreed with the strategy, right? Like you, you yeah. tried to if you can if you can bring in some guys that are not levers and not high inning guys that more situational type pitchers, right? Yeah. And if you can pick a couple outs out and get them out, great. By all means, do so because you, like you said, you protect that bullpen. When it started going south and they weren't making changes, probably as fast as I would have as a manager, I was a little worried for sure. Um, you know, you start seeing you know, Zane Morehouse warm up in an emergency, you know, bottom of the ninth, you're like, oh, things are getting real. Um, like, I, I didn't feel like the game was ever out of hand, like they were just going to completely blow it. But yeah, I mean, there was definitely some moments of guys just throw it over the plate. I promise you the defense is going to catch the ball. So <laughs> yeah, that was a that was a theme of the weekend there, you can probably say. But yeah, I mean, Texas picked up the, the victory on Friday. It was a really solid all around performance, um, you know, up until the, the ninth inning there, um, you moved to Saturday, man, that was, uh, that was probably the worst loss of the year, just from a perspective of a game they should have won a game they kind of had in the bag. Um, Charlie Hurley, he, he made his first Saturday start of the year, I believe. And, uh, man, he just didn't have it. Um, it just, it was a tough day on the bump. It will happen to most pitchers. You hate to see it happen in you know to that degree um to to start the game off there but he he just kind of got smoked he, he couldn't find the plate uh it was a bad outing for him hopefully he will be able to rebound from there because you know that's that's what baseball is all about there is usually almost always another game and Hurley will be back on the mound here shortly in some capacity and um you know it'll just be we'll see how he responds but Heston Toll and DJ Burke were able to come in in relief and uh they did a really good job they were probably you know two of the better non-Lucas Gordon arms that we saw this weekend. Um, yeah. What were your thoughts there from Hurley at the beginning and then how Toll and Burke were able to keep Texas in the game there on Saturday? Yeah, you know, I, Hurley was a weird one, right? Like, he's a guy that's really kept his walks and his his strikeout ratio really, really nice over the beginning of the yeah. year. But he has been in a different role, right? He's been in a bullpen role. He hasn't started games the way he did at USC. And so, I don't know if that threw off his mentality. Maybe he was afraid to throw a little bit harder and then he tried to adjust and was throwing overthrowing. Like he just, he didn't seem comfortable at, at the mound. I don't know, maybe footing wise, like he lost his release point and just couldn't adjust in game. I wasn't in those conversations, but to me, I saw a lot of different things that could be going on and, and none of them were good, obviously, because he didn't go very far. Um, then you look at Heston Toll and Burke and, you know, round of applause like they kept texas in that game they kept them just throwing up zeros time and time again you know there there was a couple of hard hits but nothing crazy they were able to really cruise along especially especially toll i thought man this is the kid that everyone expected to see coming from arkansas you know the kid that's healthy he doesn't have a plus fastball we know that but he's got good run on it he's got good shape on it and then his his slider was devastating 
Um, and he was able to keep them off the board. And, and to me, that really saved the game and put Texas in a position to win, which I think they should have won, <laughs> to be fair. Um, but then, yeah, you know, Zane and, and Stewart come in and and all, all, all thoughts of happiness went away very quickly. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you just look at the box score, Texas scores four runs in the top of the first. And it's like, all right, this is perfect. You know, you win the game Friday, you come out Saturday afternoon and you just bury them right off the bat. You've got your big righty on the mound. You know, this is perfect. And then, you know, Hurley has a bad outing and Baylor puts up five in the bottom of the first. And we're thinking, all right, well, a whole new ball game we got here. And then Baylor scores zero runs from the second inning through the eighth inning, just zeros all across the board, thanks to Tolan Burke, like we mentioned. And then uh, Texas is able to, you know, add runs. The, the offense was solid all weekend. You know, the wind was blowing in. There weren't a ton of moonshots, but I mean, they were getting hits. They were doing their thing, you know, really nothing to complain about this weekend about the Texas offense. They were solid. And then uh, you go into the ninth with a four run lead and, and Baylor hangs a five spot, just like they did in the first inning. You've got five in the first, five in the ninth as Zane Morehouse, um, you know, he just lost it. He melted down. He, he, he couldn't find the zone. He was hitting batters. He was throwing wild pitches. Um, you know, that's, that's David Pierce's guy. He usually likes to ride it out with his closer. And then, uh, so he was hesitant to make the move there. There weren't too many options left to be honest. I mean, cause you had Staley and uh, LBJ lined up to pitch Sunday. Maybe you could have gone to LBJ there to secure the win on Saturday. But besides that, you know, the two guys were, the two guys that were warming up were Chris Stewart and Andre Duplantier. You know, neither one of those guys are usually going to be your first choice to bring into a high leverage situation there in the ninth. Um, it was a tough spot. And then, yeah, eventually Chris Stewart does come in the game allows the game winning hit there's a review the guy's clearly safe so that just kind of adds to the pain as texas fans are there watching the game and they're like hmm definitely seemed like that guy was safe even though the umpire called him out so then we have to wait for the review they show the review eight times we're like okay texas definitely lost let's go ahead and uh, get on with our lives and you've got to wait for them to come out of the dugout make the official call but it goes crazy uh Man, that one sucked. Um, you know, where where does the back end of the Texas bullpen go from here as far as say Morehouse and just kind of how how Pierce has been handling the situation up to this point and how you know that might have to shift now going forward after after another tough loss in the ninth. Yeah, and I mean you look at a guy like Stewart, he he has the stuff, right? He's got the arm movement, he's got the, the velocity. The biggest thing I continue to see from him is he can't land his slider. Yeah. And as a result, the ball that was hit, it's a fastball over the plate. He's got to throw it and he's got to land it in the strike zone. And people just say, the book on Stewart is lay off his slider, hold your spot, look dead red and smack the shit out of it. Um, you know, it's, it's, that's unfortunate, right? Because he's got good stuff. And, and Pierce has kind of talked about this a couple of times throughout is I need my guys to be able to land their breaking ball or land their slider or land their curveball. And, and they have it, you know, they, they've left him up. Even Zane had a lot of issues landing his stuff and his fastball. I don't know. It was weird. Like he has, he has a lot of run on his fastball anyways, but he, he could not figure out inside outside. It was, he was spraying all over the place. And so, yeah, I, you know, I don't know where you go from here. Like, do you put a guy like Heston toll and take him out of that mid relief role? Do you purely bring him in as kind of a two, two inning saver? Like, do you bring him at the back end to say, look, we'll use David Shaw. We'll use some of these guys to let get to the guy like Toll, who you know is going to throw strikes and is going to throw a slider that you can't hit a bomb on. Maybe. I don't know. Like, that's that's something you might want to take a look at, though, because right yeah. now the, the system of trying to get to these high leverage roles and coming up empty is, is not working. So, yeah. Yeah. I want to go back and forth on that a little bit later. I just think specifically with Zane. um, it's just probably time to remove the, you know, this is our closer kind of set in stone label from him at this point, because he's been the guy here for a couple of weeks that every single time it's a high leverage spot, safe situation. Zay Morehouse is coming in the game if available. And it's been up and down to this point. I'm not saying I don't, I don't, you know, this is all hurts to say, as you know, I, I ride shotgun on the Zane Morehouse bandwagon I have since last year. Um, so I'm not, I don't think, he just, you know, should be a guy that doesn't pitch anymore. He should, he should still be in semi high leverage roles, but I don't think he needs to be the set closer. I think David Pierce can go a little bit more with 
the hot hand who's been pitching well lately, the matchups lefty righty, you know, if you see a specific team struggling against breaking balls in the zone, you think, all right, Heston toll. If you think, you know, this team is susceptible to fastball command, you can go DJ Burke. You've got lefties, um, you know, David Shaw. There are some other options there where I don't think Zane needs to be the set guy anymore that it just is the first choice in every single high leverage situation. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, enough about that Saturday game. That was just just a complete dagger. Um, Texas still had a chance to win the series on Sunday, and they were able to. Um, it was another kind of a crazy game. Man, Travis Staley, uh, he was came out really good in the first inning, second inning, just kind of an absolute meltdown. And then David Pierce does not pull the plug on Travis Staley. And <laughs> that decision, Zach, it it – I think it won them the game as weird as it sounds to not pull the plug on Staley there because somehow, some way, I don't know how he did it. I've been in that situation. I mean, all these guys are a million times better than I ever was, but I've been in the situation before where you lose command completely. It is really hard to get it back. Once you've already lost it in the middle of a game, that's pretty much what happened to Staley. Like he had the disaster second inning. He continued to walk guys, but he didn't really give up too many runs afterwards. And he is able to end up giving them a few innings, which saves the bullpen. And they did not have many relievers left. I mean, because you're obviously hesitant to bring in Zane Morehouse on Sunday. Toll and Burke are both burned. So I'm going into Sunday thing. You've got Staley. You've got LBJ. And then, you know, you can use Ace Whitehead if you want him. David Shaw, I don't think he was ready to go back-to-back outings since he's been dealing with some arm tenderness. So, I mean, that decision to ride with Staley and just cross your fingers and hope he gets through that ridiculous second inning, it ended up being a huge one that ended up kind of winning the game. But yeah, I mean, man, the the Travis Staley roller coaster, that would be the most popular ride at your local amusement park because, man, you just never know what you're going to get because not even from like a command perspective, because, you know, one of the craziest stats of this game, Travis Staley entered the start with 10 walks on the year. Yeah. So, you know, he had he'd been up and down just as far as success outing to outing, but he had been throwing strikes. He walked eight batters, you know, in, in four and change innings, almost doubled his walk total on the year. He hit a batter. Um, it was just it was one of the more ridiculous pitching lines that you will that you will find. It was <laughs> I mean, he, he allowed zero hits. Baylor did not have a hit until Ace Whitehead came in the game. Yeah. It was two earned runs. It was eight walks. It was. I mean, it was just, just hang that, you know, take the Travis Staley pitching box score and just put it in the hall of fame of wacky baseball stuff, because I I have not seen an outing like that, you know, in a long time. Yeah. I mean, to your point, Texas had a no hitter to the sixth inning, (laughs) a no hitter. They'd given up two runs, but they had a no hitter. Yeah. Um, And yeah, like you said, Staley's been really, you know, I don't want to call him a good pitcher. One of the reasons that Pierce talked about moving Staley out of that Saturday role was he said, my expectation of Saturday starters, they're going to go five innings, no matter what they must. That's the absolute minimum is five innings. I would like them to go six or seven. Now, of course you see what Hurley did on Saturday. You go, well, okay, we need to revisit the drawing board, <laughs> Yeah, but Staley went four and two thirds innings, gave up no runs or he gave up two runs unearned. Um, oh, two, two earned runs, but no, or two earned runs. Yeah. But no hits. Right. And so he put Texas in a place to win. Like he, to your point, like he pretty oh, much saved that game to, to an extent. And, um, and then, you know, LBJ came in and he, he wasn't as sharp as he could be. Like at times he was pumping 97, but that the fastball had too much sink on it. And I feel like he's still from game to game. You don't know what you're going to get from a release point from him, whether he has it or doesn't have it. And if, if batters, don't have to worry about the bottom of the zone. They can tee off on and on on LBJ and wait for him to throw one in the dirt or wait for him to just to mess up. And um, you know, it, it you know, Texas came out with the win, but they were they were trailing from the six onward. They were down two runs. Um, but they were able to come back and they were able to, you know, Kennedy hit a shot into the river, which hasn't happened in a while. Like, you know. It happens, but not every day. So he really got a hold of one, and the wind was blowing in all day. So, um, and really all weekend, Saturday and Sunday. But yeah, I you know Texas did kind of they scrapped and clawed and just did what they needed to do to get a win, which was 
unexpected at some point. You know, I think when you saw when you saw Staley leave and Baylor comes back with a five unanswered, you're like, well, this team is done, right? Like they're they're dead. And yet somehow they just kind of pulled it out. <laughs> so you know, yeah. Galvan, who had who had been swinging at air all day long on sliders, hits a slider into center field for an for an RBI, and you're like, wow. Okay, you know, you just keep going to the well, and at some point, this is baseball. You're going to get a hit. Like I said, it was the perfect college baseball weekend because you saw a mix of everything. People can't hit a slider, and they suddenly get an RBI. People throw strikes, they can't hit the strike zone, you know, to save their life. So, yeah, crazy. Yeah, no, I mean, it was – I thought overall the 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 LBJ outing was, was pretty impressive just given there was nobody coming in behind LBJ, Zach. They were yeah. – I mean, they were cooked from a bullpen perspective. They did not, I mean, LBJ was going to finish that game on the mound. David Pierce knew it. You know, Woody Williams knew it. LBJ knew it out there on the mound. It was his game. They did not have many guys left to bring him behind him. And uh, I thought the slider was better. I thought he was landing it in the zone more often to where at least they did have to respect it a bit. Um, But I don't know. We've been talking for a while now. We kind of buried the lead. Baylor is horrible. They they looked so bad all weekend. They I mean they're fielding the ball. They they had one pitcher that looked somewhat impressive. It was a Sunday starter, Rigney. The hitting was not great. I mean they, Baylor was bad. Texas should have yeah. swept them. But I think LB I mean LBJ he did what he had to do. You know three a three inning save is a three inning save is very impressive one earned run. So that was a big um, a big outing by him just to secure that series win. And you know it was a series that I mean we say Texas couldn't afford to lose. That would have. It would have been a disaster to lose that series just after what we saw from the Bears. It just it would have been tough to, you know, uh, plug yeah. in the mic, plug in the mic today and uh, hop on the old Zoom. But um, you, bring, you bring up two points right there, right? So Baylor's best starting pitcher, they pitch backwards. So their best yeah. guys on Sunday, they expect they're they, they fully go in expecting essentially <laughs> to lose a series and try to gain. Let's just avoid a, the sweep, baby. Just avoid the sweep on Sunday. That's literally what their pitching staff tells you. Um. But to, to exemplify Baylor, they had a second baseman that comes in and literally couldn't throw like a, on a not even a soft grounder, just a routine grounder, double clutches, and EK beats out a si- infield single on us on a hit to second base. He's throw, standing 15, 20 feet away. What does Baylor do the next game after he makes two errors and just has a complete, you know, terrible game? They move him to the left field. I'm like, what are you doing? You can- you can't put him in left field. That's where the ball goes 90% of the time if you're going to hit to the outfield. I, and, of course, he made an error there. And so, yeah, you talk about, like, the number of the number of foul balls that dropped in. And, granted, staring into the sun is no fun, right? But the number of outs they could have recorded just by catching foul balls this past weekend was, was unbelievable. Yeah, it, the whole series, like, makes my head hurt when I think college baseball. <laughs> Was that the, was that the AM transfer that was out there at second base? And then uh, he's the one that kind of solidified the position, Straysner. Gotcha. Um, it was the uh I think it was Posey that was, had been playing second base and then moved to left field that had all the issues. So yeah, I mean it was just a ridiculous weekend. The first game we had a first base umpire just flat out get the yips and forget the forget the rules of the sport of uh baseball, which is not ideal from a from a division one umpire. But Zach, I mean. Let's, let's look at the standings here just a little bit. Uh, I'll run through it, then I'll let you deep dive on what everyone has left and what we're looking for. But we've got Texas um, at the top at eight and four. Kansas State coming in at nine and six, second place. And you've got TCU seven and five, West Virginia at five and four. Oklahoma State lost the series this weekend against West Virginia. They come in at eight and seven. You have Texas Tech sitting there at six and six. Really, uh, you know, that that sweep, we'll go back to it over and over again, but that sweep of te- Texas Tech just continues to be absolutely huge. Um, you've got Kansas at five and seven. And then last place, you have Baylor at five and ten. I do not know how Baylor has five conference wins after having to sit through 27 innings of Baylor Bear baseball this weekend. It just goes to show you, man, I mean, the conference is bad this year. Baylor's got five wins. Kansas has five wins. Teams are just losing left and right. You can't predict who's going to win what. It is the conference is there for the taking this year, and it is, whew, it, it is kind of rough out there this year. Yeah, you know, to some degree, it's almost like who who actually wants this thing? You, yeah. you have a team like TCU and Oklahoma State, and even Texas Tech getting swept by Texas, and it, they're getting beat by teams, and you're like, what is going on? You know, Oklahoma has four conference wins. 
at least two of those came against TCU. Um, who TCU just lost two out of three this weekend, by the way, to UNC Wilmington. Wilmington. Just and, because, and, of course, and, naturally. And, and they didn't just lose; they got beat fourteen <laughs> to six and twelve to six. Oh, okay. At home, I I don't right. know what you're doing. Are you playing baseball? What? Um, and then you have games like this weekend. I I legitimately thought it was a football game at one point, and I don't remember the final score. K State was up on Kansas twenty one to thirteen in the seventh inning. This an extra I, I stopped paying attention. I was like, nah. <laughs> it's baseball, not the spring game, guys. Y'all, y'all can, you can pitch. I mean, the pitching this year, which we knew going in, right? If you look at all the stats, if you look at all the players that folks lost, no team had more than one starting pitching returning to the rotation. But I mean, this is like a apocalyptic bad starting rotation this year in the Big 12. It's it's not good. You never know what you're going to get. And it puts a lot of pressure on the bullpen, which is never a, a recipe for success. Um, yeah. But if you look at the series remaining, you know, you talk about K-State being nine and six. They're second in conference right now. They still have to play versus Texas Tech at Oklahoma State and versus TCU. Now, granted, everything's been topsy-turvy, but in my mind, you might as well just write them off. That's three series losses right there. Maybe they win one. Maybe they do something crazy, but I don't see them contending for the title. TCU is second, or I'm sorry, third in conference. They play at West Virginia versus Texas versus Baylor, and then they're at K-State to finish it. I could see anything from a conference champion to they're down in the middle of the pack. I mean, they're the way they played up and down, their defense has been questionable. Uh, and then you have West Virginia who I, you know, preseason, I, I would like to pat myself on the back a little bit. Cause I said they were the dark horse. They're at 25 and 11 overall, but they're five and four in conference. But then you look, Oh, who do they play versus TCU at Baylor versus Oklahoma versus tech and at Texas. That, you know, TCU, Texas Tech, and Texas, that's, those are some tough schedules right there. Um, so, I mean, they could play themselves in, but I, I don't see it. And so then you look all the way down, and who's next? Well, Oklahoma State has eight wins and seven losses already. Yeah. If you look at the average number of losses per season that wins the Big 12, it's seven, which means they have zero margin for error. And granted, their schedule is not exactly killer. They got at Kansas, Kansas State, and then Oklahoma. So, yeah, sure, they could sweep all three teams and, you know, end up winning the conference out of nowhere, but likely they're going to drop a game here and there because they haven't been very steady. And then Texas Tech is 6-6, six and six, so they already have six losses, and they have not a tough schedule. They have Baylor at K-State, at West Virginia, and Kansas. So, you know, West Virginia or K-State steals a game or two, and suddenly they're not in contention. So at the end of the day, Texas has put themselves in a marvelous position um with two huge series remaining right the tcu and the west virginia series loom large ou and kansas are series that you know not are they're not just must win but if you can get a sweep out of either one of those i they, they're they're prohibitive favor to win it all so yeah yeah i mean it's all i mean we, we've been looking at the schedule stuff all year and we've been breaking down the remaining series left for a while now but I mean, the more I watch the conference, the more I think, man, I don't know. Like, you'll go through some of it and you'll say, oh, this team's got a tough schedule left or this team has, you know, got a pretty easy schedule left. And, I mean, my, I'm just starting to think, like, I might push back a little bit on that just because it's like, man, I really think none of these teams are very good. So, unless you're going to Texas or you're going to Texas Tech – I think those are both hard places to win. We we know Texas is good at home. We know Texas Tech is good at home. Or if you're hosting Baylor, I would like to think you are going to win those games. But outside of those, you know, sp very specific matchups, you know, I I don't know if Oklahoma State is going to win two games against Kansas State, or I don't know if, you know, if West Virginia is going to take care of business against Oklahoma. Like, I don't, I just don't know. Like, it's just, it is so up and down this year. I just think the series remaining and looking at it, it is, it is kind of tough to do. I mean, it's always important to do and it's fun to look at, but, and I agree with you that Texas theoretically and on paper is in a good spot. And some of these other teams theoretically and on paper have a tougher schedule and an easier schedule. But I just think some of that is, is just really starting to go out of the window this year as I just start to see more and more of the flaws in all of these teams. And you, and you talk about playing at home. 
this yeah. past weekend, no home team won their series. <laughs> Even TCU, who played out of conference at home, lost. The away team won every single series. That, that's, that should not happen. The home team should always have some level of benefit of fans, you know, a weird ballpark dimension, you know, some Juco guy that no one's ever heard of suddenly getting an inning. Like, it's – there's no reason for the away team to win every single series. <laughs> so – it's yeah, to your point, you don't know what you're gonna get. It's it's definitely a box of chocolates this year. So yeah, I definitely would not be stringing together um, you know, five leg money line big 12 parlays because you're just not gonna win, man. Spoiler alert, it's just not happening. Yeah. Um, I want to circle back to the pitching stuff really quickly. We can fly through this. I want to do a little bit of uh armchair quarterbacks and backseat driving. This is just I mean, I really just want to do this to illuminate how tough of an exercise this really is because there are limited options right now with just um, how it has been trending with the pitching staff lately and all the walks and stuff. Um, I just want to run through what, what roles would we have these guys in because it's very difficult right now. I'll start it off. I think if I were the one um, making decisions, I would ro- obviously rolling out Lucas Gordon on Fridays, hoping he can give you seven, um, six is fine. I think I'm going with LBJ um, to start Saturdays because I feel like he's he's a, he's been fine as a starter at times. We know the ceiling is there. Um, David Pierce has talked about how he wants to get some length out of that Saturday spot. I just don't know if that's a thing that is going to happen this year. I don't know who you can turn to and say, that guy is definitely giving me six innings on Saturday. I just don't know. I mean, like LBJ definitely can do that. You know, Travis Staley can do that. Charlie Hurley can do that but they have also all shown you that that's not, you know, money in the bank every single time. So I'd go LBJ Saturday. I would go Travis Staley on Sunday just to see uh, what he can give you. And then I'm putting Charlie Hurley back into that role. We saw him earlier in the year where he's coming in either on Saturday or Sunday, just in a bulk role. You know, he's going three or four out of the bullpen. He's coming in, he's up in the velo a little bit up in the intensity because he's no, he's, he knows that he's in a relief role. I think he looks really good and he looks really comfortable doing that earlier in the year. So I'm putting him back in that spot. And then uh, my high leverage arms, you know, I, I I don't think you can put like one set closer on this team right now. I would have DJ Burke, David Shaw, and Heston Toll as my three, you know, high leverage arms to get the really big outs. I would have Zane Morehouse in a semi high leverage role. You know, he just goes out there. Maybe you need a couple strikeouts. You see if he has it. If he hasn't, you let him ride. If he doesn't have it, he's on a short leash, you take him out. And then uh, from there, man, you just you need guys to step up. You know, maybe Ace Whitehead can give you a little more on the weekend. Um, maybe you can try to get some outs from other guys. It just it didn't really go that well this weekend. Maybe they're able to build some momentum in practice and then some midweek games. But that's kind of where I stand with, with what we might, with what I would probably do going forward. I don't know what we will see going forward. I imagine it would look something like that. Um I've been rambling a little bit. What do you, what would you go with just here quickly? So I think you've said this before, like we've, we've spent way too much time together lately because we're thinking very similar, right? So for me on a Friday, a win is essential. You have to have it. So for me, you, you go Gordo, you hope you can get six or seven out of him. And then you turn it over to Zane, assuming you have that lead, right? Um, and, and we've seen in the past where Gordo Zane, that, that transition has worked really, really well because you got the left-handed movement, then you got the right-handed, you know, the really dangerous curveball, breaking ball, fastball mix. And then on Friday, I'm sorry, on Saturday, the matchup that I really like is, is you pointed out LBJ to start out the game. And then you go to Hurley for a bulk role. Yep. Instead of bringing a Hurley as a starter, you bring him in, you allow him to piggyback with LBJ because LBJ might give you five, meaning you can really save Hurley or he might give you three, in which case you extend Hurley out. You, you pitch Hurley from four to eight or four to seven because it sets up the back end really, really well. Right. And those two guys, the amount of tilt they have, the amount of difference in their movement and the shape of their, their fastball and their sinker, I think you can really keep a balance or uh, the offense off balance. And then for Sunday, it it really allows you a lot of options, right? Cause you could go Staley toll and then maybe Burke for the back end, or you could go like Staley Shaw toll to set up Burke, you know, some variation thereof. And so now when Pierce talks about, well, these are my seven best arms or my six best arms, it gives you Sunday and it gives you a lot of flexibility. If case Staley only goes four, well, great. We only expect him to go four. So now you can go toll, you know, you can get three out of, well, that 
that's already in the seventh inning now or eighth inning. Hey, great. You know, we're, we're sitting really pretty. So granted, there's always going to be situations where it's, you know, you want to match up lefty on lefty or you want to get really specialized. But for me, I, I, I really like that, that mix because you're, you're using complementary arms and you're keeping offensive on balance. They're not seeing the same shape. So yeah, no, I think that's a really good, like, you know, dream scenario outcome. You know, I think, you know, the more realistic is you're probably going to have to use like a DJ Burke or a Heston Toll on a Friday. And then on a Sunday, you know, you're yes, just, for sure. most of these guys you're going to have to use two or three times on a weekend. Um, if they're, if their bodies and their arms are able to bounce back quick enough, but enough about that. I really do not want to think about that Baylor series ever again for the rest of my time on earth. Um, but well, I mean, I say that, but then I'm about to say, let's talk about the Oklahoma Sooners, which also I do not want to do because who wants to do that? But let's just talk about why Texas might be able to come away with a win this weekend. Um, Zach, go ahead and tell me about the Sooners while I turn the volume down really quick and, uh, you know, just check some stuff on my phone here. Just, you know, <laughs> Yeah, so OU's coming to town, uh, the old beloved Sooners. Um, they're 19 and 18 on the year, and that's not a typo. They're they're one game above 500. Uh, yeah, the team, four- the team that uh, lost in the national championship last year. Just, <laughs> yeah. just more college baseball shenanigans. They're 4-8 uh, they're in the Big 12, and like I said, two of those wins came against TCU in a series win, which, of, of course, why not? Uh, the other win came on Sunday against Texas Tech when they blew them out. It was like a 10-2 to 2 game. Um, and then I think they, yeah, they stole the game from Baylor. Uh, they were swept by K-State. But at the same time, in between some of these conference games, they had a, a four-game series against Stanford in which they went 2-2. Two and two. Oh, okay, sure, why not? Like, that makes zero sense at all. So it's a team that has no consistency at all. Um, you know, you look at their splits – they're 12 and nine at home, five and seven on the road. So they're not a team that like you can really pattern. They just seem to be bad in general, um, which if you look at their pitching and their defense, you kind of start to see where that is, right? They're hitting 284 on the season, which is comparable to Texas, but their fielding is 965 and their ERA is 557. That's, that's not a very good team. Like you're going to lose a lot of games when you, when you pitch bad and you can't play defense. Um and so, yeah, if you look at it, it's just overall, I think they've got a lot of transfers. Same thing that uh, Skip tried to do a couple of years ago. You bring in a bunch of Juco guys, you try to fill holes and that, that takes a lot of time to gel. And sometimes it doesn't gel. We saw that back in 2021 when OU was really, really bad. And they were coming off a team of 2020 that looked like it was going to be really, really good. Um, you know, we can get to the pitching here in a moment, but offensively, they've got McKenzie, who's a Sam Houston transfer. He's at the top of the lineup hitting 331. He's got five home runs. Uh, Kendall Pettis, you know, he's hitting 330. He's another guy that you, you get on base and you steal. And McKenzie, he's 19 of 22 on the base pass. Um, Easton Carmichael, he's a true freshman. He's come out on fire. You know, he's got four home runs hitting 325. Uh, and then you hear Rocco, who's got 305 batting average. He's another true freshman. So when, when two of your top four uh, hitters are freshmen, you're going to have some issues. And you notice we didn't hear Jack Nicholas or John Spikerman, who everyone was thought was going to be all rolled and they've really struggled. They're down in the two twenties and two sixties. So yeah, it's just not a complete team. They have, they've got a lot of holes. They lost a lot of talent, same as Texas and they haven't bounced back nearly the way that Texas has. Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely been a, um, not a, not a very heroic title defense here from the Sooners thus far. Um, we look at quickly who we expect to see on the mound this weekend for Oklahoma Friday um, should be James hit. He is a six foot lefty. He's a sophomore. He transferred from Texas tech. He's got a four, two, five ERA one, two, two whip. Um, the thing you notice when you look at the stats of this guy, there's a lot of balls put in play. You know, he doesn't walk too many guys. He doesn't strike out too many guys. So he's the guy that kind of relies on his defense. Um, it, that'll kind of make or break him. There's just, a lot of chances to put the ball in play against James Hitt on Friday, another lefty that Texas will have to deal with. Saturday, you've got uh, Braxton, Braxton Doubthit. Um, he is a right-handed pitcher, 5'10". He's a grad student from Lamar. He got smacked around pretty good this past weekend by Texas Tech there in Lubbock. 4-2-4 ERA, 1-3-3 whip. Um, 
He's got an even strikeout to walk ratio, which is never great. So he definitely has some command issues at times. He has uh, trouble putting guys away. You know, whenever you see a guy that basically has the same amount of strikeouts as walks, that's a little bit of a red flag there, especially on the road against a team like Texas that we know can really swing it from the right and left side of the plate. Sunday, Braden Carmichael, he has been uh, their best pitcher, at least numbers wise. He is a lefty, another lefty 5'10 redshirt senior. He was not in the rotation until three weeks ago, but he's been pretty solid ever since he has moved in the, ro- the rotation. 265 ERA, 30 strikeouts to eight walks. That's a little more of the ratio that you would like to see from a starter. So yet again, another weird thing that Texas run into this year, um, the Sunday starter might be, in fact, the best pitcher that they face. Just kind of a weird thing that you don't would that you would not typically expect to see, but that you will see this year. But uh yeah, those are those are the three starting pitchers that we might see this weekend. Nothing crazy. Uh, I expect kind of business as usual there from the Texas offense. We'll see which way is the wind. We'll see which way the wind is blowing there at the dish. But you know, five, six, seven runs a game sounds about right. And then from there, you just trust your defense and uh, hope the pitchers are, are throwing more strikes at the dish than they were in Waco. Yeah, I mean, and the thing is, if you look at their relievers. You know, their best reliever is probably Carson Atwood with a 3-3-1 ERA, but he's 0-2 on the season. The rest of the relievers are all four plus. Um, you know, even there's their guy that has all the saves. He has six saves on the season, Aaron Weber. He's 0-2 with a 6-2-3 ERA. So it's it's not a pitching lineup that should scare Texas at home. I think for me, the the thing about Oklahoma is they have the ability to get on base and put pressure on you by stealing and a lot of moving, you know, they love the, the chaos, right? That's what um, assistant coach Pettis really brought into the team. And um, I don't know. I mean, we can jump ahead to predictions, but I, I think this is a series win for Texas without any, you know, imagination or stretch of the imagination, but the, the movement of Braden and Carmichael into the weekend rotation does present a potential problem on Sunday where Texas. Yeah may be using a variety of arms to try and get the win. That usually doesn't set up well for a, a sweep, right? So um, I really like the ability of Texas getting into the win on Friday, especially against James Hit. You know, he's a Texas Tech transfer. He's not a guy that should scare Texas, but he is a left-hander. So, you know, it'll be on Texas to really do well against a, a lefty. So, Yeah. What did you have uh, last week in predictions? Did you have Baylor sweep or Jeff 2-1 and one for Texas? No, I had a sweep. Yeah, so. we both had sweep last weekend. Um, I think for the record, we were correct in the sweep. I think Texas was wrong. That that's <laughs> yeah. what I with that one. Our prediction was correct after watching that series Max. and watching yeah. Baylor. We were correct in predicting the sweep. Texas was incorrect because they just happened to lose one. Um, but yeah, I am also going to go with two and one this weekend for Texas. I think Texas is the better team. Texas is at home. I think the pitching staff will throw a lot more strikes back at the dish. Um, yeah, I just think it's a pretty straightforward two and one. Like you said, I feel really good about Lucas Gordon in the Friday night game. Sunday scares me a little bit. That one feels like a little bit more of a coin flip with OU having their best pitcher slated on Sunday with who knows what Texas will have left at that point. Um, Zach, some other series going on around the Big 12 this weekend. If you want to uh, try to pick these, you go for it. I will not be doing so, but uh, we've got TCU at West Virginia, Oklahoma State at Kansas, Texas Tech hosting Baylor, and then Kansas State taking on uh, UC Irvine. What stands out to you there? Yeah, I think the one that stands out immediately, right, is that TCU at West Virginia. West Virginia has shown at times they can play with anyone, and they've also shown that they can lose to Baylor. So, you know, who shows up at West Virginia, I think is going to be big. I think. TCU comes in with a little chip on their shoulder, knowing that they just got beat by UC and UC, UNC Wilmington. Um, they'll have something looking to prove, especially now that they're, they're kind of there at the cusp of we could win another like Big 12 title. Um, I think the other two series, right, Oklahoma State at Kansas and then Baylor at Texas Tech, realistically what you want to see is for Texas, at least, if you're a Texas fan, is both teams avoiding getting swept. Yeah. You want to see Baylor steal one. You want to see Kansas steal one because otherwise that, that does put a lot more pressure on the Texas Longhorns, of course, but um, you know, a single loss by either Oklahoma state or Texas tech really, really puts them in a, 
almost impossible hole to climb out of for the Big 12 title race. So, yeah, TCU West Virginia definitely seems like a big one. Those teams are both still in the mix. I think you hit the nail on the head earlier with Oklahoma State. It's like they already have seven losses, and we never know who's going to beat who in this conference. So, just have a hard time believing they're going to reel off a crazy win streak. Um, some other series you want to point out this weekend around college baseball. I know we were talking before the show, we are both very high on Vanderbilt. I'm a little surprised to see them still come in at number four. Um, they feel like probably, you know, a deserving of a number one, a number one or number two ranking. Yeah. You know, and the ACC race continues to be kind of what the big 12 was last year. It's a bunch of really good teams kind of just beating each other up. So you got 18 North Carolina and 20 Boston college They've both had up and down weekends recently. And so that usually leads to some fireworks. Uh, you know, you talk about it. Number four, Vanderbilt, who I think is in my eyes, could be the very best team in the nation at the end of the at the end of the season. Uh is taking on an unranked Tennessee squad. Uh, you know, you hate to see it, but I don't think there's many tears for old Tony Vitella right now. <laughs> um, then you get into some mid-major madness. You got 10 Coastal Carolina versus number 24 so- Southern Miss. That is going to be big when you look at who could potentially get in a regional um, bid or even maybe a super regional bid at the end of the year out of those mid-major squads. Uh, you know, Sun Belt, Fun Belt, it's always the way to go. And then, uh, you know, a, a really exciting series is you got Jack Caglione versus the freshman Ethan Perry. So Florida, who's number three, versus number six, South Carolina. Um, I'm expecting home runs. I'm expecting fireworks, gators. Yard Cox, it's going to be nuts, uh, a lot of offense. So that'll be really fun to watch. And then heading out to the West Coast, kind of a resurgent um, Arizona State squad. And then t- uh, number 21, Oregon State, who's come out of nowhere. They were kind of left for dead. And suddenly they're they're right back in it, right? And they, they either swept or won the series at USC this past weekend. So that'll be exciting to watch to see kind of where those teams go forward because the West Coast, to be honest, has been a big bunch of meh this season. So, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, uh, you know, it, it's crazy to see Tennessee now unranked after starting the season number two. Imagine picking them to win the whole thing before the season started. Could not be me. Um, Zach, important to point out before we get out of here, we obviously did not talk about the Wednesday night game against Abilene Christian. By the time this is posted, that game might have already happened. That game might not have already happened. Um, If anything does happen crazy in the Abilene Christian game, I will say um, we have got some tentative plans to be a part of another Twitter spaces on Thursday nights with um, Nash and with Nash Talks Texas and Occupied Left Field. So be on the lookout for that on the old Bird app. Um, Also exciting news, which um, if you were listening to this as a podcast, you probably realize this is now available as a podcast, which is exciting. So you can find this show now, not only on YouTube, where you can see our very average looking faces. You can also listen to our voices on Spotify and on Apple Podcasts. If you are doing that, please take the time to give us a hit the little five star, give us a nice review, say, wow, you guys, you guys really know ball. Um, you guys are really good with predictions. Um, you guys are great. You know, love you guys. You guys are the best. Feel free to drop that there in the little description saying give us that five star rating on YouTube. You can always like the video, subscribe to the channel, check us out on orangebloods.com, all kinds of written content, game threads. You already know we've got people firing takes throughout the weekend. Those are always fun to read through and interact with. Um, And with that, Zach, I will let you make some uh, closing remarks here before we get out of here and prepare for more baseball. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's going to be a fun weekend at the dish. Um, there's Monster Jam in town. So, you know, take your little one to, to see Monster Jam, like my little one wants to go to, uh, and then come out to the ballpark. It's it's fun playing OU, especially when they're bad. Uh, hopefully Texas just completely whips up on them. Uh, should be lots of fun, though. And uh, definitely join the conversation on, on Thursday evening on the uh, on the Twitter. That'll be lots of fun talking Texas baseball. It's always great to to get questions and and talk Texas baseball. So, yeah. Appreciate yeah, just a bonus there, um, just to sweeten the pot a little bit there on Thursday night. That is planned for 8 p.m. as of right now. Uh, my beloved Golden State Warriors are down 0-2 in their series against the Sacramento Kings and will be tipping off at 9 p.m. on Thursday. So if you want to listen to me try to talk about Texas baseball before I uh, have a little mental breakdown there on my couch on Thursday night, 
you will get to hear me in a completely different headspace um, as I try to breathe in through my nose and out through my mouth without falling on my floor or uh, crying to a pillow there. But, uh, you know, just a spoiled NBA tangent there. But with that, feel free to join in all of the conversation. We're always talking Texas baseball, always interacting with people on Twitter and on Orange Bloods. And with that, we will get out of here. We will see everyone next week. Um, you know, hope everyone can make it out to the dish if you're in town. And uh, with that, yeah, we'll be back next week. And uh, see everyone later. Welcome.